So now, dear friends, let's resume our reading of Keshanam Bhati. The conclusion about preamble would be, just to see pieces, it seems to me the preamble of our constitution is of extreme importance. And the constitution should be read and interpreted in the light of the grand and noble vision expressed in the preamble. Now I may briefly describe the scheme of the constitution and then he runs down to the scheme of the party. Constitution, he reads article one which says India is a Bharat, that recently there was a debate about India being replaced with the word Bharat. Actually both words are there. Then part A, B, C states are mentioned. Article two then goes to fundamental rights, describes what fundamental rights are available in 14, 22, then the importance of 25, 26. In para 120, he summarizes, as will be shown later, the inclusion of special rights for minority has great significance. They are clearly intended to be inalienable. The right to property comes last, and it is dealt in Article 31 as originally enacted it dealt with the right and the property and prevented deprivation of the property saved by authority of law and then provided for compulsory acquisition for public purposes on payment of compensation. It had three significant provisions which shows the intention of constitution makers regarding property rights. The first is Article 31 sub clause 4. This provision was intended to protect legislation dealing with agrarian reforms. Now, initially, when ninth schedule was to be populated, okay, it was 31's object was only agri-green. The second provision, Article 31.5a, was designed to protect existing legislation dealing with compulsory acquisition. Some acts saved by these provisions did not provide for payment of full compensation. Example, UP Town Improvements Act 1990. The third provision, Article 31 sub clause 6, provided a protective umbrella to similar laws enacted not more than 18 months before the commencement of the constitution. So 31 actually has three stages. Firstly, first was 31 sub clause 4, which was the agrarian reforms. Second was 31 5A, which was designed to protect the existing legislation dealing with compulsory acquisitions, some of which did not even provide for full compensation. And lastly, okay, it provided an 18 months window to those laws, okay, which were identical and were enacted not more than 18 months before the commencement of constitution. The fundamental rights were considered of such importance that right was given to an aggrieved person to go the highest court of the land, that is the Supreme Court, by appropriate proceedings for the enforcement of the rights conferred by this part. And this was guaranteed. Article 32. Two sub clause two confers wide powers on Supreme Court to issue directions and orders or writs, including writs in the nature of habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, co warrant, and certiorari, whichever may be appropriate for the enforcement of any of the rights conferred by this part, that is part three. Article 32 sub clause four further provides that the right guaranteed by this argument should not be suspended except as otherwise provided by constitution. Article 33 enables Parliament to make law to determine to what extent any of the rights conferred by this Part 3 shall in their application to the members of armed forces. Okay, so the, Then Article 34 enables the Parliament by law to indemnify any person in the service of union. Part 4 of the Constitution contains directive principle. Okay, And this part shall not be enforceable by any court. But the principle therein laid are nevertheless fundamental in the governance of the country. And it shall be the duty of the state to apply this principle in making the laws. This clearly shows that it has been laid down by this court that these provisions are not justiciable and cannot be enforced by any court of law. The courts could not, for instance, issue a mandamus directing the state to provide adequate means of livelihood to every citizen. It actually should have been a fundamental right, but because it's included in directive principle, it has gone wasted. Okay. Some of the directive principles are of great fundamental importance in governance of the country. But the question is not whether they are important. The question is whether they override the fundamental rights. In other words, can parliament abrogate fundamental rights in order to give effect to some of the directive principles? Now, 
having set out okay the fundamental rights what justice city is trying to do is he is trying to play the balancing act and to find out which one is supreme can directive principle okay which are not justiciable could override fundamental rights i may now provide briefly okay brief notice of directive principle mentioned in part 4 then he reads 38 and all that's so all directive principles okay 44 enjoys the state shall endeavor to secure the citizen of india uniform civil code throughout the territory of india desirable as it is the government has not been able to take effective steps towards the realization of the goal obviously no court can compel the government to lay down a uniform civil code even though it is essentially desirable in the interest of integrity and unity of the country 45 directs that the state shall endeavor to provide within a period of 10 years from the commencement of this constitution a free compulsory education to all children until they complete the age of 14 years okay this is now a fundamental right steps for preserving improving breeds and prohibiting slaughter of cows then 50 steps to separate the judiciary from the executive and the public services of the state Now the preliminary note on fundamental rights. The principles set forth in this part are intended for general guidance of the appropriate legislature and government in India. The application of these principles in legislation and administration shall be the care of the state and shall not be cognizable by the court. After setting out certain directive principles, he observed it is obvious that none of the above provisions is suitable for enforcement of the courts. they are really in the nature of moral precepts for the authorities of state moral precepts for the authorities of state although it may be contended that the constitution is not the proper place for moral precepts nevertheless constitutional declarations of policy of this kind are now becoming increasingly frequent they have at least an educative value okay so at least directive principles have some educative value one must pause and ask the question as to why did the constituent assembly resist the persistent efforts of shiv bn rao to make fundamental rights subject to directive principles the answer seems plain enough the constituent assembly deliberately decided not to do so and there was actually an endeavor made by shiv bn rao to say that the directive principle would be higher and fundamental rights would be subject to it but that has been negated by the constituent assembly a distinction has necessarily to be drawn between the rights which are justiciable rights and are merely intended as a guide for directive objectives of the state policy this was said by anadi krishna ayer krishna swami ayer it is impossible to equate the directive principles with fundamental rights though it cannot be denied that they are very important but to say the directive principles give a directive to take away fundamental rights in order to achieve what is directed by directive principles seems to me a contradiction in terms okay now this is actually an important highlight i seem to have missed it out i may here mention that while our fundamental rights and directive principles were being fashioned and approved by the constituent assembly on december 10 1948 the general assembly of the united nations and the nhrc the declaration may not be legally binding instrument but it shows that india understood the nature of human rights i may here quote only the preamble whereas recognition of inherent dignity of the equal and inalienable rights of all the members of human family is a foundation of freedom of justice and peace in the world whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous act which have altered the conscience of mankind now recently the gaza war has yet to shock the conscience of mankind and the advent of the world in this in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief when i say yet to shock the conscience of human mind i mean to say yet to shock the conscience of the ruling purposes people who actually are more powerful are yet to intervene and react and say that war isn't war or genocide or wiping out of entire race okay whichever it may be white or color okay is back is, is is something that man should not see it as an option i'll actually lord india when it walked away and chose the other way to look instead of taking confrontation with china 
on the forced occupation that China did of India. Whereas it is essential if a man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Whereas it is essential to promote the development of friendly relations between nations. Whereas the people of United Nations have the charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and the worth of human person, and in the equal right of men and women that have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. Whereas member of states have pledged themselves to achieve in cooperation with the United States Nations, the promotion of universal respect for observance of human rights. So what is the uh, epitome of the, or let's say what is the crux of the preamble of UDHRC is that to promote respect for observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Whereas a common understanding of these rights and freedoms is of greater importance for the full realization of this pledge. In the preamble to International Convention for Economic and Social Cultural Rights, 1966, inalienability of rights is indicated. Considering that in accordance with the principles proclaimed in the chapter of the United Nations, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal inalienable rights of all members of human family is foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world. Do rights remain inalienable if they can be amended out of existence? Okay. The preamble to Article 155-56, the pre sorry, the preamble Article 155-62-68-76 of United Nations Charter had provided for the basics for the elaboration in the UDHRC. Although there is a sharp conflict of opinion whether respect for human dignity and fundamental human rights is obligatory under charter, okay. This court must interpret the language of the constitution, if not intractable. Okay. So the, the court actually brings it uh, the directive principle. To me, that in view of section 51 of directive principle, this court must interpret the language of constitution, if not intractable, which is after all a municipal law in the light of United Nations Charter and the solemn declaration subscribed by India. The state shall endeavor to promote international peace and security, maintain just and honorable relations with nation, foster respect for international law and treaty obligations. So, and dealing with organized people and one another. Encouragement of settlement of international disputes by arbitration. So, the court says that, look, it's in one of our directive principle, Article 51, it has been stated that every international treaty would be honored. The state should endeavor to do that. So, meaning thereby, I'll give UDHRC, okay, its, uh, its commitment to see that human rights, fundamental freedoms, okay, are respected all over. Okay, so, and they are inalienable. So, I'll also uh, try to observe or I'll also try to see uh, try to find out whether they are intractable in our law also. As observed by Lord Dunning in Corofford versus Pan American Airways, it is the duty of these courts to construe our legislation so as to be in conformity with the international law or not in conflict with it. So an effort should be that any municipal judgment should actually be in conformity with the international law and not be in conflict with it. Mm -hmm. These are again his rundown to other provisions of constitution. Okay. Part 12 deals with finance of property contracts and suits. We need not notice only 265, which provides that no tax shall be labeled or collected except by authority of law. The appointments of Anglo Indian Schedule 5 340 enables. President to appoint a commission to investigate the conditions of social and educational backward classes within the territory. 341 enables the president to specify caste, races, tribes, okay, which are deemed to be scheduled caste in that state. 342 provides president to specify for tribes, communities, okay, which are deemed to be scheduled tribes in relation to that state. Then 
17 with official language, then 352 is important. The way emergency can be enforced. 353 describes the effect of proclamation of emergency. The effect is that the executive power of the union shall be extended to giving directions to any state as to the manner in which the executive power thereof is to be exercised. So in emergency, what may happen is that a state would become subordinate to the union. Okay, and the parliament would keep on uh, directing them. Okay, the executive power of the union would keep on directing how the executive power of the state is to be exercised. Exercising the parliament gives the power to make laws with respect to any matters, including the power to make laws, conferring the powers, imposing duties, etc. Notwithstanding that it is one of the subject which is not enumerated in union list. Article 354 enables the president by an order to make exceptions and modifications in the provisions of Article 268 to 279. How it is to be extended, okay, modified. Under Article 345, it is a duty of union to protect every state against external aggression and internal disturbances and to ensure that the government of every state is carried out in accordance with the provisions of constitution. The 56 contains provisions in case of failure of constitutional machinery in a state. Then proclamation of emergency again. 358 and 359 show that the constellation makers contemplated that fundamental rights might impede the state in meeting an emergency. And it was accordingly provided that Article 19 shall not operate for a limited time as long as 32 and 226 and also 32 and 26 if the president so declares by order. If it was a design that fundamental rights might be abrogated, surely they would have expressly provided for it. So mere suspension to meet out the contingencies which arise in emergency is different. What the court said is that merely because they could be suspended okay, in an emergency situation does not mean that they are inalienable or they, they are alienable or they can be taken away. Okay. I may here notice an argument that the enactment of Article 368 and 359 show that the fundamental rights were not treated as inalienable. Yes. I'm unable to infer this deduction from these articles. Okay, so what was argued that the 368, okay, you can amend any part of the constitution. 359, during emergency, your fundamental rights and the 19, okay, 32, 2 to 6 could be suspended by a presidential order. But this does not convince the court come to a conclusion that they are alienable. He says no, it can't be. I am unable to unfair, infer this reduction from these articles. In an emergency, every citizen is liable to be subjected to extraordinary restrictions. I may here notice some relevant facts and constitute the background of the process of drafting constitution. Then it goes to how the constitution was drafted. Okay. He reads Indian Independence Act, Section 6, up clause 6. He says Section 6 1 included making provisions for the constitution of the dominion. Okay. It was made clear by Section 8 1, which provided. In the case of each of the new dominions, the power of the legislature of the dominion shall, for the purpose of making provision as to the constitution of the dominion, be exercisable in the first instance by the constituent assembly of that dominion. And references in this act and legislature of the dominion shall be construed accordingly. These provisions of Indian Independence Act amply demonstrate that the constituent assembly started functioning. It knew if it acted under the Indian Independence Act, that it could limit the powers of the future dominion parliament. No similar provisions exist in any of the independence act in respect of other countries enacted by the British parliament. That is the Ghana independence act, Malaya independence act, Nigeria independence act, etc. I may mention that the aforesaid provisions of the Indian constitutions were enacted in line with the cabinet statement dated 16th May 1947. And the position of the Congress party Paragraph 20 of the statement, when this is all the history, the state, the advisory committee on the rights of citizens, minorities and tribal and excluded areas should contain full representations of the interest affected. And their function will be to report to the Union Council Assembly that the list of fundamental rights, the clauses for the protection of minorities and the scheme for the administration of the tribal and excluded areas, and to advise whether these rights should be incorporated in the provincial group of the Union Constitution. In clarifying the statement, Sir Stafford Cliff says, 
when say first statement comes. Then Maulana Abdul Kazam Azam, who was the secretary of the state state. The principal point, however, is as stated above that if you look upon the constituent assembly as a sovereign body, which can decide as it chooses in regard to any matter before it and can give effect to this decision. The only limitation we can recognize is that in regard to certain major communal issues, the decision should be by a majority of each of the two major communities. So constituent assembly is a sovereign body, okay, can decide anything that's before it. The only problem would be, or the only limitation which is recognized is that in major issues, both the majority parties, okay, both on communal issues, both the two communities, okay, uh, it should be decided by the majority of each of those two major communities. When the constituent assembly has completed its labor, His Majesty's government will recommend to the parliament such action which may necessary be for the cessation of sovereignty to the for the cessation of sovereignty to the Indian people, subject only to two provisos which are mentioned. Okay, and then those again to our report reflected here. In pursuance of the above resolution for setting up the advisory committee on fundamental rights, okay, uh, minority subcommittee was also there. Then there was an interim proposal. This discussion covered much of the importance about the prohibition of discrimination on ground of race, religion, caste, abolition of untouchability, and mandatory requirements that the enforcement of any of the disability arising out of untouchability should be made, no offense punishable, etc., and then other fundamental rights. Having dealt with the question of fundamental rights for minorities and the minority subcommittees met again in 21 July 1947 to consider the political safeguards for minorities and their representation in public services. In forwarding, in forwarding the report of the advisory committee on the subject of minority rights as a by potential, it should be treated as supplementary. Okay, I will just read the last paragraph. When the report dealt with justifiable fundamental rights, these rights were applicable to all citizens generally. And to the members of minority committee in particular, offer a most valuable safeguard for the minorities who are a comprehensive field of social life. The present report deals with what may broadly be described as political safeguards of minorities. It has representation in legislation, reservations of seats for minorities, reservation of minorities in public services, administrative machineries to ensure protection of minority rights. Then the above proceedings show that the minorities were particularly concerned with the fundamental rights, which was the subject matter of the discussions of fundamental rights committee. The above brief summary of the work of advisory committee and the minority subcommittee show that no one ever contemplated that fundamental rights appertaining to the minorities would be liable to be abrogated by the amendment of the constitution. Now I've always held the belief that it's the majority is secured by minority because there are certain fundamental rights which are inviolable, which could never have been taken out of minorities. Okay, the majority actually also has that assurance and guarantee. It's often said that to find out how peaceful a country is, just go and watch how minorities live in the world. The same is true about the proceeding of constituent assembly. Okay, and then he concludes that it is impossible to read the expression amendment to the constitution as empowering the parliament to abrogate the rights of minority. So now what Justice C.K. says is that so when you were drafting the constitution, the minorities who were much interested in the fundamental rights, they were given an assurance that they would have fundamental rights. It was not contemplated by anybody that the minorities would be robbed of these fundamental rights. If you could not have raw, okay, if the constituent assembly never contemplated that, then the word amendment to the constitution cannot be equated to say that at when we'll amend our parliament, we'll also take away the fundamental rights of minorities. If you can't take it off minorities, you can't take it off majority also. So minority is the first road bump on any erosion or encroachment on fundamental rights of the majority also. If minority loses, then there's a chance that majority would lose. Both sides relied on speeches made of the constituent assembly. 
It is, however, a sound rule of construction that speeches made in the members of legislature in the course of debates relating to the enactment of statutes cannot be used as side as aids of interpreting the constitution. So debates can't be used as aid of the interpretation. It could not reflect uh, the inarticulate mental process lying behind the majority vote, okay, which carried the bill. Nor it is reasonable to assume that the minds of those legislature were in accord. Those who did not speak may not have agreed with those who did, and those who spoke might differ from each other. So, you know, in debates, you'll have to always remember that out of 50 speaker, one may speak. And although 50 would have agreed with that one, okay, they did not expressly agree with whatever that one has spoken. They have only agreed with the vote. So the outcome is agreed upon, not his reasons. So those who did not spoke may not have agreed and with those who did and those who spoke might differ from each other. <clears throat> this rule of exclusion has not always been adhered to in America. Sometimes it is looked upon. In I.C. Golaknath, Subha Rao referred to a certain portion of the speeches made by Pandit Nehru and Dr. Ambedkar. But he made it up clear. He referred to these speeches not with a view to interpret the provisions of Article 368, which were which we propose to do on its own terms, but with only to notice the transcendental character given to the fundamental rights by two of the important architects of constitution. So what transcendental character was given by the two architects of Indian constitution? Only to decipher that, he referred to them. Before, the con before concluding the judgment, I think so we'll stop over here and we'll take it up.